Hello and welcome to Talk About It, the official podcast of Phenomenology Club. Happy Tuesday early evening for those of you who reside near to where I do on the East Coast. Uh, it's 5.26 p.m. How y'all doing? Welcome. Um, today I want to talk about something very near and dear to my heart. And that thing is noise music. Um, a lot of people don't know. First of all, I don't think necessarily everybody who listens to phenomenology club even knows that i make music which is a good thing because you know one of the reasons i host these on the phenomenology club channel and not the buttress channel is because i'm trying to create an outlet that is a thing separate from my music but i do make music my name is buttress i mostly make rap music but fun piece of buttress trivia a lot of people don't know this my music career started making noise music and in fact my buttress career started making noise music i've always been buttress but before i was buttress the person who made rap music i was buttress the person who made noise music um and i even have a release out for my uh noise music it's called structural stabilization of an historic barn you can listen to the full thing on youtube on the buttress channel and also on bandcamp where you can download it uh you can also purchase a hard copy uh unless they've been sold out i don't know i haven't visited the page in a while but you can purchase a hard copy uh it's only on cassette though because i'm so like art uh, via Nihilist Records. That's the record label run by Andy Ortman. Some of you noise enthusiasts might know about it if any of you are listening uh, from Chicago. But to start this episode, I thought that I would actually play a little song from that release. It's only 46 seconds long. I thought that we could set the mood and establish an aesthetic for this conversation about the aesthetics of noise. So this song is called Car Bamba, <laughs> which is clearly a play on the name of the largest nuclear bomb to ever exist, the Sar Bamba. I forget how many megatons it is, but it's like it's like Car Bamba, like a car bomb. Get it? Get it? <laughs> All right, let's listen to that real quick. Hopefully it's not too loud. I'm monitoring my levels. Let's see. Not gonna have you blow out your speakers over there wherever you're listening from. So, for those of you who have never listened to noise music before then, there you go. You just did. Welcome. Welcome to the wonderful, wacky world of noise music. Um, is anyone in here, by the way? Say something, please. I need validation. Y'all listen to noise music? Um, so, for those of you who don't know, uh, noise music has a, a pretty long and interesting history. It mostly exists in the or at least on the fringes of the high art world and the modern art world it is a pretty uh modern phenomena with its roots going back to the early 20th century the early 1900s i'm gonna give a little brief history but not really because i don't really want to turn this into some sort of a history lesson uh, and have a repeat of the <laughs> feminist upload, which ended up going almost two hours. Fuck that. I made a little playlist, actually, of YouTube videos. Um, 
that include the songs I will be playing a few clips from in this episode. Um, but also it includes a upload called What the Fuck is Noise Music by someone, I forget. Uh, so if you want to learn maybe a little bit more about the specifics of the history, then go watch that and go look at Wikipedia and shit and go look at whatever the fuck you want. I want to talk about uh, some other stuff. This This is not a history lesson, but just... Before we get into the history a little bit, let's let's first talk about what the fuck is noise? What does this word describe? Let's ask Merriam-Webster, our handy dandy dictionary. Okay, thank you for being here. I see you. Woo! So, according to Merriam-Webster, noise. 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 <laughs> Noise uh, has multiple definition entries, you know, because Miriam be giving us those multiple definition entries. The first one says loud, confused, or senseless, shouting, or outcry. <laughs> wow. Um, and the second definition we have says sound especially one that lacks agreeable musical quality or is noticeably unpleasant. Skipping one down, an unwanted signal or a disturbance, such as static or a variation of voltage in an electronic device or instrument, such as radio or television. So as you can see clearly, I mean, there's multiple definitions here. I haven't read all of them, but the ones I have read so far seem ultimately characterized by this idea that noise is something that is unpleasant, uh, as opposed to a thing like music, which in the first or the second definition it says, a sound, especially one that lacks agreeable musical quality or is noticeably unpleasant. So noise is almost described as being sound that is not music. An especially unpleasant sound that is not music. What? So then what the fuck is noise music? Well, let's also look at the dictionary definition for music. Because why the fuck not? We're already in the dictionary. Let's just fucking do it. Music from Miriam. Music. <laughs> Music. Definition one. A. The science or art of ordering tones or sounds in succession, in combination, and in temporal relationships to produce a composition having unity and continuity. Okay. Okay. 1B, vocal, instrumental, or mechanical sounds having rhythm, melody, or harmony. And then for the second definition, 2A, we have here the thing that seems to exist in opposition to noise. 2A, an agreeable sound. So music, according to Merriam-Webster... Uh, is also many things, but seems to ultimately be characterized with its definitions of sounds that are organized and pleasant in some capacity, right? And noise would be the thing that is almost the antithesis of this sound that is unpleasant and not musical necessarily in quality. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But let me give you this little history real quick. So... Like I said, noise music ultimately has its roots in the early 20th century per Wikipedia and also per that uh, YouTube upload that I recommended in the playlist that I've linked. Um, people say that this man, whose name is Luigi Russolo, obviously Italian, he was an Italian futurist who, according to Wikipedia, was perhaps the first noise artist. Um, and he was an, a futurist, like I said, and for those of you who didn't go to art school, like myself, futurism is a school of avant-garde art uh, that comes out of the early 20th century Italy and essentially is sort of this art movement that is very inspired by the industrial age, by all these inventions, machines, um, and basically... Uh, 
in some ways, the triumph of humanity over nature. This is what Wikipedia said. I thought that was kind of funny. But uh, the movement is sort of characterized by this. And Luigi Russolo wrote in 1913 a manifesto titled La Art de Rumori. <laughs> shitty pronunciation i'm actually italian but you'd never know from how i <laughs> try to pronounce italian words but basically the translation is the art of noises um i have uh, some quotes from it real quick basically um the manifesto itself written by luigi is um basically him going into how uh into his ideas about how music itself uh, is a thing to be kind of transcended and that the invention of machines represent the birth, the creation of noise and that within noise we can find new and infinite complexities of timber, of texture and that as we go forward into the future, uh, he believes that this will kind of become the mode of music in a certain way. He he characterizes noise, this idea of noise, and what what kind of possibilities the invention of noise represents uh, as being a thing that will take us into the future. It's progressive, so you know, <laughs> clearly it makes sense uh, why this guy is a futurist. <laughs> um. I'm going to play a, a few seconds. I'm not going to play too long because I don't want YouTube to copyright strike me or whatever the fuck. Because sometimes it like mutes everything. I hope that doesn't happen. If it does, just type something into the box. That's happened before on here. Um, but I'm going to play a few seconds from this clip. Uh, this is from 1914, a year after he wrote his manifesto, The Art of Noise. It's called Risveglio de Unas. Sita, awakening of a city. <sighs> Let's go. around a little bit okay okay chill chill <laughs> all right <laughs> Okay, enough of that. <laughs> it's too deep. So, you know, um, I forget exactly what he's doing here. If you see the image, if you go to the playlist, uh, and, and I'm not sure if this is an image from the actual performance. It looks like it might as well be. Either way, I think it's an image from one of his performances, and there's a ton of phonographs. So I believe what they were doing were uh, recording sounds from machines, sirens, whatever, random bullshit. Uh, I think, like, automobiles and shit. And just playing them back into the audience, like, bro, check this out, check that out, check this out. Cool! Um, it seems kind of absurd, right? And it's funny, it makes me think, already I'm beginning to think of this culture that <laughs> has emerged uh, in the past few years of binaural beats and sound frequency healing tone and stuff. It kind of seems like this culture of uh, listening to things like specific frequencies uh, shares a similar idealism to the kind of bullshit Luigi was talking about in his manifesto about how, you know, we are transcending something. We are coming into a new knowledge of something by immersing ourselves in these sounds. 
uh, very idealistic and maybe even spiritual, but let, let's get into that in a moment. So that's the early, early 20th century. That was from 1914. And then from there, you know, we have very famous figures such as John Cage, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, the famous composer of uh, 433, you know, that piece where where basically a piano player is instructed to go sit at a piano and do nothing for four minutes and 33 seconds. And the noise, the sound of the audience is the art. Oh my God, it's so deep. It's so conceptual. Um, but John Cage also did other things, especially, you know, relating to this these ideas that Luigi has just introduced us to, you know, playing with noise itself. I have a little clip from a John Cage film. I'll, I'll just play real quick. Uh, this is from 1966, but John Cage is much older than that. Um, I have a quote, actually, from John Cage from 1937 about noise. This is Johnny, Johnny speaking. You ready for this quote? I believe that the use of noise to make music will continue and increase until we reach a music produced through the aid of (laughs) of electrical instruments, which will make available for musical purposes any and all sounds that can be heard. That's from the future of music, Credo, 1937. And then, you know, we can see he has partially fulfilled his own prophecy because in this clip I have from 1966, John Cage is pictured playing some electric (laughs) electrical I never say that word electrical instruments himself so let's listen to a few seconds of it good times so again (laughs) you get the point um and it's funny that quote from john cage also seems similarly idealistic you know this idea that noise itself represents a transcendence of something like music a coming into a new era you know where we are sort of throwing off all the bells and whistles uh the futilities of music itself Is that Steven Crowder, someone says? Who, me? Do I sound like a Steven? No. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, that that noise represents like a moving forward into something more pure. Pure tones. 432 frequency. (laughs) Some bullshit. Um, so, so, it's, it's very interesting. Um, but you know, since John Cage, um, there's been a lot of integration of noise into experimental music, uh, just perusing the Wikipedia, I saw them mention, like, Sonic Youth and shit, I, I don't even know if I've ever heard a Sonic Youth song, maybe one, so I don't really have anything to say about that, sorry, but you know, a lot of rock bands in particular, I think even the Beatles, like, you know, had a little, like, noisy interlude on something, this and that, um, so, you know, there, there's this culture that really comes to fruition over the last century, and it's working alongside, you know, this culture in the art world, the modern art world, where people are getting further into the abstract, you know, I mean, this past century, the 20th century, Uh, really has represented to art a breaking down of form in many ways and the culture of noise music and sound art and uh, all this has definitely you know been a big part of this history 
uh, and you know, this also is is birthed out of the Dada movement, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, in the beginning of the 20th century in Europe, there were many artists that were part of this Dada movement, another avant-garde movement that basically was all about rejecting logic and reason and uh, these uh, very historical institutions of things like representational art, you know, um, which goes along with what I was just saying, you know, uh, we went from painting these almost hyper-realistic, or maybe not even realistic is the right word, uh, forms of the human body, of still lifes, of all this and that, uh, which we had been in a mode of doing for centuries and centuries in Western art, and then we're basically like, yeah, fuck it, fuck it. I'm just gonna throw this paint on the fucking canvas and do the fucking thing. Um, so, you know, that's what's going on. Um, and, you know, in the now... I would say that, I mean, do you guys listen to noise music? Can I get some feedback? Do any of you have any familiar rarity with noise music? I would say that in my impressions of, like, the general public, what they listen to, it kind of seems like the only noise artist that is really well-known is Mersbell. I don't know how that happened or why. I guess because he's he's collaborated with some big people, right? Shit, I don't even know. Mersbow, who have you collaborated with? I want to say he collaborated with Skrillex. Is that a lie? Am I just, like, shitting on Mersbow right now? <laughs> hmm, I don't know. I have no idea, actually, now that I think about it, why Mersbow became so famous. <laughs> but he did. Everybody seems to know who Mersbow is. Mersbow, whatever. Uh... So that's cool. Um, and, you know, he's Japanese. And Japan especially is so... There's so many amazing noise artists to come out of Japan. Uh, I think probably some of the best ones. So much so that Japanese noise music has its own word. Japanoise. <laughs> um, you know, and Mersbell obviously is a part of this. The band Boredoms, which I most definitely recommend if you're not familiar. Love Boredoms, especially their album... Uh, chocolate synthesizer great album um Hanata Rosh, who I've spoken about a little bit uh and I believe has one of the original boredom's members but I spoke about them in the suffering for art upload they're the people who <laughs> who had a show and came to their own show with a bulldozer and knocked the venue over <laughs> or knocked the wall over which is great um, and that's definitely a big part of this culture of noise music. I also mentioned in that upload uh, the band Eugenics Council, who is also a noise group that used to just like bring bombs to their own shows and set them off. Uh, they also, I think, mailed like biologically hazardous materials out to people once with one of their album releases. There's a culture in noise music where, you know, People are just doing absolutely absurd and really quite violent shit. I mean, I've been to many noise shows and a few times, yeah, I was definitely <laughs> felt in danger. I mean, I probably was in danger. You got to back up if some shit's going on. People will just like beat the shit out of each other as part of their performance or, you know, bring fireworks inside and just like let them off randomly. Shit like this. It's kind of funny and silly. Um, but that's a little bit of history. I want to transition a little bit into talking about the art of it, the aesthetic of it. What, what do we think? What are your guys' impressions of noise music? Does Mr. Bungle count? <laughs> I don't believe so. If I'm not mistaken, isn't Mr. Bungle some, like, hippie, like, dubstep thing that they play at, like, psychedelic outdoor fest? For <laughs> no offense, Mr. Bungle. <laughs> is Duster considered noise music? No, no idea who Duster is. Um, you know, I've been thinking about art... Uh, I've been thinking about what is truly subversive art a lot recently. The other week, I was getting really into 
one of my favorite bands, Leibach, who's been one of my favorite bands throughout the years. And I go through periods of like listening to them, uh, especially in the winter. You know, it's very good winter music. And I was reading about Leibach after having a discussion with somebody in Phenomenology Club who was basically kind of asserting that, you know, um, Leibach, a band who is very well known for these aesthetics of fascism that they use in their music. Uh, They have music videos where they're pretty much uh, dressed up as Hitler youth and they have swastikas in some of their videos. They have their their outfits are very reminiscent of fascist imagery. Uh, And a lot of people are critical of this. And um, apparently, well, also, if you know the band Ramstein, which which I'm sure you all do, they're the Du Hast motherfuckers. Um, the famous Marxist uh, Zizek has some critiques of Ramstein, where basically he says that you know they are exploiting fascist imagery in a way that is very superficial and not subversive. Um, and it's interesting because Z- Zizek actually loves Leibach, which you might be surprised by because, you know, Leibach also uses fascist imagery heavily. And he has an essay, I think it was from 1983, I'll link it in the description here as well, where he talks about this in detail, but I I found this article that basically summarizes Zizek's arguments in this essay he's writing about Leibach and why he considers them to be truly subversive where he thinks Ramstein is not subversive. Um, I'm just going to read this little quote from it because I thought it was so interesting and profound. So this is the quote from the article. It's not from Zizek's uh, essay itself. It's describing Zizek's essay. Instead of overtly critiquing or mocking fascism, Leibach imitates its strategies and copies its aesthetics faithfully. Zizek considers that the cynical distance allowed by an ironic performance would actually represent conformity in that it acknowledges the system. The system requires the appearance of dissent through criticism as a validation of its existence in order to function. So true subversion, Zizek postures, only comes through direct copying, as Leibach does. I thought that that was such an interesting and useful articulation of a thing that I personally have felt, I feel like, on some level, but never really articulated to myself, why I have such a problem with so much of what is described as ironic or satirical art. I mean, satire and irony are modes of art making that are so often employed I mean we see them used all the time and I feel like a lot of these kinds of things sort of ring flat right for reasons that Zizek kind of just allude to when you are so ironic I mean what well, well, well to be ironic or to be successful at satire a lot of people say that you have to make clear the object of your criticism you know I see this all the time I feel like there's a famous quote I'm not sure what it is if somebody knows but I see it a lot people say that you know satire is only successful if it makes obvious the group of people or the thing that is it is supposed to be criticizing but do you really feel like that's true I don't know if I feel like that's true at all because what's subversive about that you might as well have come out straight from the jump and criticize this thing you know what's the point or the usefulness of a thing like irony or satire if ultimately you say that its usefulness is found in it being obvious you know because you would think that a thing like irony would only be useful actually if you don't make clear the thing that you're being critical of right um And this is why I think I personally really like Leibach because they don't really give it to you up front. You don't, and I don't want to be like, oh, you have to think about it because, you know, personally, I can't stand these artists that just give you this thing to decode like their art is a fucking puzzle. Like, oh, you got to find the meaning, bro. Like, no, I don't. (laughs) I'm not going to sit here and figure out your fucking thing. 
I think a lot of that movie Mother by uh, Darren Arafonsky fucking hate that movie did you guys see that movie oh my god this is the peak example of this thing i'm talking about that i'm so critical of like i don't want your fucking poetic ass long ass art house film that i'm gonna have to sit here and decode and go on forums and like figure out like what does that mean Ooh, what does that represent what does that represent like fuck you guy i don't know who you think you are but like i don't have the time who the fuck has the fucking time not me (laughs) that movie sucked There were some good moments, but, like, so fucking what? It's just so masturbatory. And I think uh, a lot of irony is masturbatory. And I think that this is the very thing that alienates a lot of people from noise music in particular, you know. Um, I come from art school, (laughs) the most pretentious art school in the country, actually, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And even though it is one of the most pretentious or the most pretentious art schools ever in America, uh, I'm still very proud to be an alumni, okay? Um, But, you know, like at art school, at SAIC at least, I was always made to like witness these sort of masturbatory performances of just like people just... Ugh, just like sticking a fork in a fucking uh, children's toy to make it go like... It's called hardware hacking. They had entire classes for hardware hacking. Like, ugh, God, I'm so bored. And what is the usefulness of this kind of music? Uh, or, or a performance like that, sticking a fork in a children's toy just to be like... If not... uh. If it's not supposed to be ironic, right? I mean, I think that a lot of noise music in particular and sound art, performance art, thinking of things like John Cage's 4 minutes and 33 second performance, a lot of these things are steeped in irony. They're supposed to be ironic. A lot of noise musicians put out music that I feel like is supposed to be ironic. It's like, you would never listen to this. So I'm going to make you listen to this. It's good because it's so bad. It's <laughs> it's interesting because it's so shitty and it makes you mad and you don't want to hear this shit, you know? Um, but then also beyond that, uh, I think also that that a lot of people and like a lot of dudes in particular, I mean, the noise scene is just overrun with dudes, <laughs> and especially dude bras. I think that a lot of the reasons they get into it is because it uh, kind of presents a facade of intelligence. It banks on inaccessibility. It's kind of like, it reminds me of like astrology. <laughs> you know, like people who get so into like um, birth charts and shit, they're, <laughs> they're like, they they have a certain sense of pride that they accumulate for themselves by getting into something that is perceived by the general public as being inaccessible, you know? And in that sense, you can't really fact check a lot of them. They almost like create a impenetrable wall between themselves and others. Like, well, you can't criticize this thing I'm doing because you don't understand this thing I'm doing, you know? I think that that's totally true of a lot of people and a lot of dude bras who get into noise music and even just like analog synths in general you know because there's a lot of crossover between analog synth culture or just analog culture and noise music in general uh people like to appear as if they are just so much more intelligent than you you know and And a lot of times, this kind of works, you know. If you're somebody that has no idea how to generate a signal uh, out of a machine that this person is performing on right in front of you, you might be impressed just up front or, or at least intimidated by this impression that you cannot access whatever it is that they're doing, you know. Um... But then you hear it, and a lot of times, I think it just kind of sounds like shit, you know? So I think that a lot of people have come to internalize ideas about noise music in particular, where um, they feel as if it's just kind of pretentious and masturbatory, and I think that that's uh, for good reason, because it's absolutely true, I would say, that the majority of noise musicians are really just dude bras jacking off trying to look smart for each other 
you know, who's got the who's got the best thing, who's got the craziest setup, who's got the blah 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 blah. Whatever, guys. Who cares? Uh, but I think that despite this being true, there is still much to appreciate about noise music, and I'm going to try to help you understand how you can navigate this hellish reality because there is a lot of great noise music uh and it's great for reasons that i'll tell you about but let me let's let's listen to some examples so i've queued up an example of some noise music that i find to be uh stupid (laughs) for a lot of the reasons that i've just described i find it to be masturbatory and almost ironic and dumb uh and it's by white house white house is the industrial power electronics band from chicago uh with the famous member peter sotos who uh is also famous for being a child pornography enthusiast and uh has come into a lot of controversy for including child pornography in uh a lot of his fucking dumb art. Oh, fuck him. <laughs> He's so, oh, God. And even in art school, you know, I don't even care if I air anyone out. Because fuck you if you're listening. You're probably not. I don't even remember this kid's name. My TA in my analog synthesis class actually uh, started to become, like, mentored by Peter Sotos. Um, and it was just bizarre. I mean, he was basically sort of advocating for pedophilia in some of his art projects at school and oh it was just so dumb it was almost like you know how how uncomfortable can I make you and I think that that's part of the appeal for a lot of these dude bras with noise music like oh I'm gonna make everyone upset I'm gonna freak you out I'm gonna do this and that uh but let's listen to some White House this is an example of something that I think is dumb and boring and stupid this is called Oh shit, where'd my where'd my playlist go? Hold on one sec. Uh where's my playlist? Damn it. Nope. One second, one second. Okay, here we go. Okay, this is White House. I'm just going to play a few seconds or, I don't know, a minute of this bullshit. Uh, It's called (laughs) Lightning Struck My Dick by White House. This came out in 1994. Uh, The album is called Halogen, and it came out on the label Susan Lawley. Uh, So let's listen to some White House. Yeah. Remember, are you guys fans of the movie Face Off by John Boo? What year did that come out? I forget. But I love the part when, uh, oh, my volume was low, sorry. I love the part when Nick Cage is on the airplane in the beginning. He's like, I'm bored. (laughs) That's how I feel listening to White House. I'm fucking bored. And uh, I think that this this White House is totally one of these groups that's just like, look what I could do. Uh, And it's boring. It's boring to listen to. And if you don't understand at least a little bit of what they're doing, I think it's easy to write off all noise music. It's boring and stupid. But now I'm going to play something. This is the this is one of the releases that actually got me into noise music and made me feel as if there is something uh, to be appreciated in noise music. It's called. 
Oh, God, where's my playlist? Well, it's by Kasumoto Endo uh, from his album While You Were Out. Uh, this track is also called While You Were Out. It's 13 minutes long, so I won't play all of it, obviously. But Kasumoto Endo is my favorite noise music. He's also <laughs> noise musician. He's also on Twitter, so make sure you go follow him. He's always doing cool shit and posting cool videos. Um, and he's just amazing. And actually, I'm not even going to speak about technique or anything. I want I want you to tell me if you appreciate this recording more than the one I just previously played and why. Uh, so let's hear a little bit of While You Were Out by Kazumoto Endo, the fucking man. at a later point. Hold on, I'm clicking ahead. excerpt uh it wasn't actually the excerpt i meant to play sorry i had it queued up but whatever either way it's great great album it's funny because i was reading the youtube comments for it and somebody says one of the most highly voted comments on this upload this has to be the most accessible harsh noise album ever and they didn't elaborate on that but i thought that that was very interesting you know because i think it's also very true and this is the album that got me into noise music because i think that Kazumoto Endo is such a talented musician because you can really hear the intent behind a lot of his decisions. In many ways, it's a showcase of a performance and also a showcase of technical abilities uh, in the sense of him understanding his own equipment. I think that you don't even need to have a strong knowledge of exactly how things like electronic signals work in creating a thing like noise music or any sort of synthesis for you to be able to hear this element of control that I feel Kasumoto Endo has uh, a lot of, you know, compared to a thing like White House which we just listened to. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't sound like they really even have any control over what they're doing. It just kind of sounds like they're droning on and on and on. And drone music especially is so uh big in the the noise scene, you know. I don't even know if you would call drone music technically noise, but if you go to a noise show and there's a few acts on the bill, chances are that there will be someone that just drones on and on and on. It's basically like a live performance of a binaural beats <laughs> YouTube playlist, you know. It's just like like okay, dude, why am I listening to this? I don't give a fuck. Fuck you. Uh, but looking at the YouTube comments, too, or the comments you're typing in here, somebody says, 
Steve, Sean, sorry, not Steve, Sean2112, have there been any horror movies with noise soundtracks? Actually, yes. <laughs> I made a film called Visitor 420 <laughs> uh, where I did the soundtrack and a lot of it's noise music. So go check it out. You can watch it in full on YouTube. Visitor 420 on the Butcher's channel. But also... <laughs> Uh, I made that film in film school, and I was very inspired at the moment by uh, Tetsuo the Iron Man, one of my favorite films ever, which I'll probably do an entire episode on one day, because Tetsuo the Iron Man, I think, is... It, Tetsuo the Iron Man is almost a good... It, you could draw, like, a parallel to this conversation to talk about film. I feel like Tetsuo is to experimental film as Kazumoto is to noise music, you know. Both of these institutions, quote-unquote, have so much masturbatory, dumb, boring bullshit. But there are reasons, and reasons that can be pretty clearly articulated uh, for why I think you would appreciate a film like Tetsuo more than you might appreciate uh, a similar experimental film like a racer head sorry not gonna go there right now um but also looking at the comments chris marquez said a little bit ago my impression of noise music is that it is a similar concept as free jazz just expressing the concept of sound and notes as art uh and i i absolutely agree i don't know if i agree with that phrasing but I totally agree, and I think that it's not a coincidence that some of the best noise music to be coming out in our modern era, in the past few decades especially, uh, the best noise musicians are also people that tend to work with uh, jazz artists, and in particular free jazz artists, and it's funny. I wanted to cue up, this is the last thing I'll play a clip of, this is one of my favorite albums as well, my favorite free jazz albums. Uh, by Keiji Haino and Tatsuya Yoshida. Uh, the album's called New Rap, and I'm going to play a clip from this song, West Broadway, which is one of my favorites. If you don't know who Keiji Haino is, you're welcome, because Keiji is that dude. I got to see him in Brooklyn like two years ago. It was awesome. He didn't do a lot of the vocalizations, which I was sad about. Maybe his throat hurt. <laughs> but it was great. Uh, KG Haino also is somebody who has such a huge discography that, um, you know, depending on what you look up, you might not even realize that uh, some of his music sounds like this. But this is my some of my favorite uh, KG Haino music ever. And the vocalizations you can hear, this is KG. And KG also works with a lot of noise music musicians historically. I think him and Merzbow have some, like, uh performance on youtube too so check it out if you're into that uh so this is west broadway or a clip of it from new rap Okay, I'm not going to play that full thing. I know that that's definitely copyrighted. I hope YouTube didn't... Did they mute me? Am I here? Can you hear me? Uh, I hope it's all good. But anyway, KG Hino, that's my dude. Um, and, you know, you can see from listening to that, uh, it, is, it is definitely free jazz as fuck. And those of you who are familiar with John Zorn, which I'm sure a lot of, of you are familiar with, I mean, John Zorn is kind of the Mers bow of free jazz everybody knows john zorn but it seems like that's all anybody fucking knows like it's it's really a shame you know i've met people who think that that nothing else exists that sounds like john zorn like isn't that crazy 
there's such a huge world of free jazz. There's so much that sounds like John Zorn. Like, I just, I can't believe it to think that John Zorn is the only person that makes those John Zorn sounds. I love John Zorn, by the way. Uh, even though, you know, I spent a lot of time going to free jazz shows religiously, sometimes up to like three or four times in one week when I was living in Chicago, which just has this amazing free jazz scene while I was there. And uh, <laughs> a lot of the free jazz dudes had some interesting things to say about John Zorn. Um, so there's like, there's like contention there. <laughs> but whatever. I love John. John's great. I actually saw him last year perform a, um, it was, oh, I forget what the piece was called. But basically, he composed a vocal arrangement that was inspired by Hildegard von Bingen, the famous, uh, is it 12th century medieval nun who uh, composed some of the most amazing music. I'll find the name of the piece. I tried looking for it online, uh, but I couldn't find it. The, a performance of it anyway, but I'm sure I could find the name of it. I'll post it in the description once I find it. But yeah, anyway, anyway. I love noise music. Do you guys love noise music? And, well, actually, the reason that I did this upload is because I'm trying to get more into it recently. I just played a noise show for the first time in a long time, a few years, uh, a few days ago. It went really well, and it was just so fun to be there. I had such a great fucking time. Um, and I was thinking about how especially thinking about like Leibach and politics and aesthetics of fascism and stuff, which is also a huge thing in the noise world. I mean, so many noise artists in particular use like fascist imagery on their album covers, in their outfits. I mean, I've been in noise shows where people like totally look like they're trying to look kind of like a Nazi or something. You know, there's a lot of combat boots and leather and armbands and, and military looking outfits all this pretentious bullshit um but i was thinking about how it's really interesting and i said this on twitter it was a hit tweet um it's interesting how a lot of people like shit on the noise scene for this reason that uh it has troublesome or problematic quote-unquote politics but i find that well, first of all, if you ignore the fascist boys, I think that noise music has much more interesting politics than some of these other quote-unquote progressive scenes, especially punk music. This is what I was thinking is something that it runs almost counter to, you know? I feel like hardcore bros and punk bros in particular, a lot of them kind of shit on the noise scene because they, like, you know, describe all these, like, noise bros and industrial bros as, like, a bunch of fascists and shit. But it's interesting because punk music, while it may have more quote-unquote progressive politics in its scene you know people the people the members of it the individual members have more progressive politics as music punk music and hardcore music is like totally pretty conservative right I mean like sure it has things like distortion and yelling but like it's pretty it, it has pretty like straightforward uh tempo and rhythm and general musicality as co as as compared to a thing like noise which is just totally pure fucking chaos you know it's basically like free form and i think that's why chris says that it reminds him of free jazz because it basically is it is so jazz in many ways or at least the best the best noise music like kasumoto endo which when you're listening to it, you hear it as a performance. And I think this is ultimately what makes noise music, good noise music, enjoyable. Uh, the element of control and of performance. Because what is art? Art is a thing that is created, right, by a human. And ultimately, what we appreciate about art is, I would say a recognition of this a recognition of the fact that a human created it so the more control you show in a performance I think the more naturally your audience will come to admire your performance and your art I think that noise music pre presents as a really interesting vehicle for basically showcasing abilities both in a way that uh you can showcase like your general uh 
control over like musicality or whatever, but then also control over your actual hardware, you know. If you actually know what you're doing on some of these machines, you can do really amazing, complex sounds and create all these sorts of interesting textures and timbers and all this shit, you know. But you won't do that if you're just some fucking dude sticking a fork in a children's toy. So I think that that's ultimately the difference, you know. Between good noise music and bad noise music. I think good noise music is ultimately about the performance and the musicality as it relates to things like texture. Um, Whereas I would say bad noise music is ironic. What do you guys think about all this? Hmm? Hmm? What do we think about noise music, irony, and art? I was going to say also that I do think on a certain level I have to concede that even to consider the best noise musicians, the ones that I consider the best, like Kasumoto Endo uh, and Boredoms and Random People, um, I think that on a certain level, even though I'm critical of the thing we're calling irony, I think that irony is sort of integrated into the structure of noise music itself in a certain way because... Ultimately, part of the effectiveness, I think, of the sounds is found in the fact that you don't hear them so often. You know what I'm saying? I think a lot of, like, noise bros, like, treat it as ironic, like, oh, you don't like this. This noise is unpleasant or something, and I think that that's stupid. But I also think at the same time, a big part of the appeal of noise music and part of why it's so fun to listen to does have to do with the fact that maybe you could call it ironic on a certain level, that we don't really encounter a lot of these sounds in real life, you know. You don't really hear this shit, and you certainly don't sit in a gallery or in a warehouse often and hear this shit, you know, unless you go to noise shows all the time. And perhaps if we heard these sounds more often, and we're witness to these kinds of performances more often, then it's likely to think that even this thing could ultimately lose its appeal. And it's interesting wondering about that. Like, you know, where is the subversion found? What if noise music was a thing that we heard on the radio? Which, who knows, maybe one day. I think ultimately even that would become, it would become less less subversive so I do have to concede that on some level I do think that this concept of irony is still applicable to even the best noise music that's what I have to say (laughs) I wish I could just stick a fork into a toy and get a circuit bent instrument but it just doesn't work that way you sure about that Look it up on YouTube. I'm sure you could find out how to start making some uh, circuit bending music with only a fork and a children's toy. I'm not sure exactly what, what's got to touch what, but I'm pretty sure it's possible. Sabumatrine doesn't like noise music. Why not? Sabumatrine. Is that how I say your name? I feel like you told me once that's not how you say it. <laughs> Sabumatrine? It sounds like Zabumafu. Colin says, noise is agreeable to me. Me too, Colin. Sean says, noise seems like an exploration of and experimentation with texture taken to the extreme. Yeah, well, it's interesting to, to, to bring it back to the full circle. Uh, to talk about Luigi, what's his name? <laughs> What's this motherfucker's name? Luigi Russolo's manifesto that he wrote in 1913. I think, like I said, on some level, it's absolutely idealist and sounds almost spiritual and stupid. Some of these ideas he's putting forth that, you know, noise represents this coming into a new era where we can explore infinite textures and the complexities of sound itself and we will transcend the limitations of music, blah, 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 blah. 
which, you know, in certain ways, I mean, it sounds so idealistic for one because it seems to be a very narrow perspective. It seems like everything he's saying will transcend about music. He's talking mostly about like traditionally Western forms of music. I think the more you listen to world music and especially world music from centuries that precede Luigi by a long time, you can find things like explorations of textures you might consider to be noisy, you know, especially within like certain African styles of music and drumming there's definitely a lot of like texture exploration that I would say uh, is very atonal and could be something that you could draw parallels with to noise music um, but even beyond that uh, it just it just kind of sounds sounds silly but I think too that it is an interesting idea. I'm looking at the conclusions right now that he has, uh, the conclusions at the end of his Art of Noise manifesto. Um, let's see. Number six conclusion. This is the list of conclusions he puts at the end. The new orchestra will not evoke new and novel emotions by imitating the noises of life, but by finding new and unique combinations of tim t timbres and rhythms in noise to find a way to fully express the rhythm and sound that stretches beyond normal, uninebriated comprehension. <laughs> I mean, that sounds silly. It does. Uh, and it makes me think of binaural beats YouTube again. But I do think that there is something compelling about the idea, especially since we know that certain frequencies and tonalities can invoke within the human audience a pretty particular measured response uh, in some ways for things that are like very strange. There's a certain frequency, I forget which one it is, but scientists apparently have said that to play this frequency for a person results in them feeling as if they are in the presence of a large entity, which some describe as like a god or something, you know. But that might just be a specific description from, you know, a specific viewpoint. But this idea that like, can, can a frequency itself like instill within you a sense of there being a presence nearby, you know, or the brown sound... <laughs> This frequency that's supposed to make you feel as if you have to shit. A lot of people swear that it really makes them feel this way. Um, I've listened to it trying to determine whether or not it makes me shit. And I didn't shit my parents, so I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell what's psychosomatic and what might be real. But it's really interesting to think like, hey, perhaps, perhaps if these kinds of things are true, what does that mean for the future of music as we go on discovering these truths of how frequencies may influence us as individuals like on on a physiological level? Are we going to start integrating these kinds of things into our music? And it's only really made possible now with uh, the advent of this kind of technology where we could harness specific frequencies and extend them and do this or that with them. So who knows, brah? Who knows? Maybe we are on the brink of something. I mean, electronic music has completely transformed music as we know it, right? This past century, pretty much all music is electronic now. Everything on the radio... I don't think there's anything that's just like pure acoustic anymore. Some dude singing with his guitar or some shit. Pretty much any song you'll hear on the radio has some element of electronic music or synthesis, right? Anyway, I've been going on for an hour and three minutes. I hope that this was fun. <laughs> what do you guys got to say? Anything? Anything fun? Anything fun? You guys like noise music? Who's your favorite noise musicians? Okay, so Subumatrine is a weight loss drug. Glad to know. Glad to know that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully you found this insightful. Uh, even if just to get exposed to some fun, new, interesting musicians. Um, and I'm talking to somebody that I performed with at the Noise Show about doing a split release this year for another buttress noise release so i hope you uh, check that out whenever that happens 
Spady just got here. Damn it, Spady. Well, it's okay because I'm about to finish and then you can listen to it from the beginning. Let me know what you think, Spady, because you're a musician and I value your input. But anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, Book club, by the way, just a little announcement. Book club is meeting on Sunday. Um, And I, <laughs> I believe we're reading uh, Angle's Nature of Dialectics. But I'm actually about to go read that so that I can confirm that. <laughs> because the Marx reading that I originally assigned was not appropriate. Sorry. I don't know who that is. Sign DJ Freak did some good noisy hardcore. Well, link us, link us. Put a comment. But uh, happy Tuesday, everybody. Hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday. And stay trippy, okay? Goodbye.